Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the August Triangle SQL Server User Group main meeting. In front of me, on screen, the handsome Andy Leonard. Uh, so tonight, no real announcements. Welcome everybody in chat. Welcome everybody in person. Much appreciated. A uh, way that we normally work this out, I say normally because we've done this twice now, so now it's, now it's a routine. If there are questions, from our live studio audience, uh, take them at any time or whenever Andy wants them. Questions in chat, I will repeat them at my own discretion. Uh, I may decide to change your words to make it funnier, but we'll see. <laughs> so with that, I am gonna go on mute and unmute Andy and that way we can kick things off for real. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, it's always an honor to present and especially when I get to drive down to God's country Love coming down to North Carolina. I was letting my kids know, we were driving to Myrtle Beach a couple months ago and I, I introduced them to the phrase, North and South Kakalaki. And I was like, y'all cannot be true redneck children unless you understand what, so they've been all over YouTube looking for videos about North and South Kakalaki. So my work is kind of done for the next week or so in their education. Um, my name's Andy Leonard and I'm with a company called Enterprise Data and Analytics. We call it Edna, kind of like the character in The Incredibles. I thought she was pretty awesome. Uh, no capes. Uh, and we're going to be talking today about moving data with Azure Data Factory or ADF. This is an introductory course. If you have questions about security, everybody has questions about security. Not going to be able to answer it. <laughs> not in this presentation, not in this context. Um, I'll try. If you have a question, ask about anything, including security, and I'll try and answer it. But there's a lot of really good questions out there about ADF, and the main reason I'm getting a lot of questions is I've written about it a lot on my blog, and people search for it, and they find me in the top whatever. And they'll come to the blog looking for an answer, and usually they'll find something close and then send me an email or do, there's a contact on there, and I'll get it that way. And I'm totally fine with that. What the reason that it's increasing, <clears throat> I think, is because so many people have started using it. <laughs> that's that's why. And I get the big question I get about Azure Data Factory is, is it ready? Is it ready for production? And I think in more cases than not, the answer today is yes. Now, a few not not many months ago, I would have said, eh, some. And uh, maybe a year or so ago, I would have said. It'll do a few things, you know, really well, and then as long as you use it for what they built for it, it'll do fine. But what they've done is they've expanded uh, kind of the repertoire and the surface area and the footprint of what ADF can handle. And I, I, what I keep seeing is that it is a, it's continually improving, and it's happening on a weekly, if not daily basis. I warn uh, people when I do this presentation that there's a really good chance I will be in the middle of my presentation, go to a screen in the Azure portal and see something I've never seen before. That happens just about every time now. So there's a lot of changes that are going on here. I'll point it out when it does happen. It bit me at my last presentation in Augusta because I did not rehearse my presentation within a few days. In fact, I, I was on vacation and I was like, yeah. It's been a, what, what could they have changed in the last month? I couldn't get hardly anything to work, so I had to fall back to sneaky presenter tricks to survive that. But if the people that were paying attention in Augusta noticed I was sweating, there was a reason for that. It wasn't just the humidity in August. There's a little bit of stuff up here about me, but if you go to your favorite search engine, I like to refer to that as Bengal. I totally stole that from Ed Watson. And you can put in my name and data, and you'll find out some stuff. But there's uh, stuff in here like uh, husband, dad, grandfather, and um, uh, co-host of the Data Driven Podcast. And we did something neat last week. We did a virtual summit. I don't know if anybody saw or even heard about the virtual summit. It was kind of cool. We're going to do some more of those. We didn't advertise it heavily because it was our first one. Um, I do SSIS and Bumble. Uh, of course, I do Azure and ADF, and at the very end of this, I'll share some uh, stuff about some training we do. So this is my, me and my kids. This was taken about six months ago, five, six months ago. And I kind of have to go over here where I can point because laser pointers don't work on LCDs. Um, but I have five children, uh, two from my first marriage. This is uh, Amanda and Penny, and then these three, Stevie Ray and Emma Grace and Riley. 
They're from my uh, second marriage, and I've gotten so old, I have to version them. So uh, this is 1.1, Amanda. And by the way, she's running for Virginia Senate. I'm really proud of her. Um, we disagree on politics, but I still i am really proud of her. Love her, love her to death. 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2. And then not pictured as my wife, 2. Oh, actually, she's the, um, the release to manufacturing wife. And she's, you know, a little more stable than the beta. Yeah. And uh, has, um, well, uh, a few less bugs and a couple extra features, too. So. Uh, <laughs> But then there's uh, this, she's 2.0, this is 2.1 and 2.2 and 2.3. Not pictured on my grandchildren, I also have five grandchildren. Uh, so not pictured on 1.1.1, 1 .1 .1, 2 and 3, and 1.2, sorry, 1.1.1 1 .1 and 2, 1.2.1, 2 and 3. They're not pictured. So pretty uh, pretty awesome family there. Yeah? Are you using SQL hierarchy to figure all that out? I should. I should use a hierarchy uh, data type, yes. <laughs> hierarchy ID. Um, so one of those slides, and I mentioned just now, too, I'm a, I'm a grandpa. So Grandpa Andy's going to tell you a little story, if that's okay. And it's a story of something called Andy Weather. And this actually was built, the website, andyweather.com. You'll see a snapshot of it in a bit. And the Twitter handle, at Andy Weather. These were actually built back in 2008. And if you go there now, you can actually see stuff. I doubt it's working. It wasn't working the other day, and I have been slammed for like a week and I didn't look at it for like two weeks before that. <laughs> but this is a story of how uh, Andy Weather came together. And the first set of instruments was actually the 1.0 version. They are they died years ago. And I let them set. I just didn't do anything with it for a while. But I had data for a couple years. And in my training classes that I do for SSIS, we actually use the data from Andy Weather 1.0 to, uh, to teach you SSIS. And the reason that I, I like it is it's real world data. And I got, you know, a lot of people use AdventureWorks and Wide World Importers and all of those stuff. And I got nothing against Northwind or Pubs or any of those. But nobody's data is that clean, you know. So as a consultant, I see Kevin shaking his head. You, you go into places and sometimes you have these uncomfortable conversations with sea levels where you say, um, you know, tell me about how dirty your data is. And they'll say things like, oh, our data is perfect. And I'm watching the data architects do what Kevin's doing now. You can't see him on camera, but he's snickering. Um, and it's just nobody's, nobody's data is perfect. There's a number of reasons for it. But this instrument pack here, this is, the, this is an AccuRite weather station. You can buy it on Amazon. I want to say it's somewhere between 100 and 150 bucks. It's not terribly expensive, but it's more expensive than, you know, a cheaper hobby. And... One of the things on that slide about me was I'm an engineer, and I, I really need to put that in like flashing red. That's a warning. So um, just so you know, this is a, I think this box is either 12 or 14 years old. It's got two, count them, two gigs of RAM. It's a 32-bit e-machine, and it's tufted out. So I use it. I connect it by USB cable to the base station of the instruments pack. The, instru the base station communicates with the instruments, which is... Uh, currently um, mounted on my deck and every 12 minutes or so it's picking up uh, and recording actually new information it's picking it up pretty much real time and displaying it there on the display but by USB cable it, it puts a new entry into a CSV file every 12 minutes why would I use this this Windows uh, machine here this e-machine why would I use that it's running 32-bit 107 ultimate the updates don't work anymore why would I even do this to myself? Well, it's because of that warning about being an engineer. I'm cool when everything works like it's supposed to work. In fact, I love it when I build something and it works. But as an engineer, I need to break it because I need to see what it's going to do when it breaks. There's actually three apps running on there. There's the app that comes from AccuRite. And it also allows me to post updates to Weather Underground. If you've never heard of it, weatherunderground.com has got, I don't know, a, a, a few tens of thousands, I think hundreds of thousands of personal weather stations out there. I'm, I'm out there outside of uh, south of Farmville, Virginia. And my little station, when it's reporting, it reports out there. But it breaks often. Um, it, it writes to that. And then <clears throat> I've written about 20 to 30 lines of C-sharp. I didn't even write them. I got them offline. Uh, little console apps that will uh, pick up that CSV file once an hour, and it does it 
uh, about 12 minutes after the hour, and it copies it over into um, Azure Blob Storage here. And you can see this is the actual account. We'll look at the, well, that's a bad, that's an old picture of it, but you'll see a remarkably similar picture of that uh, before we're done tonight. We're going to look at this, and and then when that blob is is overridden, it's actually deleted and then created. And in Azure Data Factory, you can trigger events like the execution of a pipeline that loads weather data on blob created. And that's exactly what happens. So as soon as it finishes uploading, kind of nice, right? Anybody who's ever done SSIS and tried to load a CSV file or something, and you're waiting for it to finish FTPing into the folder, you try to load it and you get that error, can't do it because it's still in use. This uh, fixes that for you. It waits till it's done and then it triggers, it raises the event, uh, blob created, and then ADF will see that and it runs this pipeline here. And this is a truncate and load pattern that's very similar to um, truncate and load patterns in other platforms, including SSIS. I've got a store procedure call here. This is a store procedure activity you can see on the screen here. And it's named WAC for WAC and load. And then I've got a copy AW, a copy Andy Weather Data, which reads from blob storage and writes to a table. And that table looks like this. It's in Azure SQL DB because I'm cheap. And I just wanted to, again, I'm stressing, right? I want to see what it looks like. Push it and see where it breaks. Um, there's not enough data in here to break right now. Only about 56,000 lines. Uh, one every, um, I, I guess, I think it's, yeah, one every 12 minutes now is what's in there. <clears throat> and it uploads it once an hour. <clears throat> it does that, that upload, that overwrite, again, is about a dozen lines of code in one C-sharp console app that's being executed by Windows Scheduler. <clears throat> again, in Windows 7 Ultimate 32-bit, and it, it fires and does the upload once an hour. When that happens, it then populates this table. First it truncates it, then it loads this table, and there's a stored proc called get latest readings or something like that, and you'll see the results of that. You'll see the latest reading in the database if you go to andyweather.com right now, and you should see, if it's working, you'll see 6 p.m., um, for 6 p.m. August 20th. It may not be working, and I didn't check before I started. And, um, of course, there's another 10 or 12 lines of code over there that uh, it will tweet, and it actually does the tweets once every 12 minutes or so. It's actually scheduled to, to fire a tweet, and you'll see this is a, a message from March that it put up there. It gives you the temperature in my office from the base station. That's where the instrument is for that. Then it's reading outside and giving you the instruments off, you know, the, the values that it has there. So that's my story of Andy. Well, if you want, I'll send you the, um, the slides, and these links work. But there's a post uh, down here at the very bottom of the screen, Andy Weather Internet of Things. Like I said, this started in 2008 when GoDaddy uh, made available, and I think it was in SQL Server 2008, or R2. They made available a DMZ, so you could write data into this and read it from it. And it was IoT before uh, it was even called IoT. So they, uh, that's, what they, that's what they did back in the day, and I just started using it uh, because I could. And I wanted to play with this and see. I think the best tools were once toys. So this is still something that I play with and stress every now and then. So with that, I'm going to do some demos. And what I'd like to do in a demo is start by uh, the first demo. Is I'd like to build that for you. Is that okay? Kind of see all of the moving parts and how you put it together. Because I left out a bunch of steps when I talked about how to, how to make it go. So I'm going to start with, the, um, with Azure Explorer, uh, Storage Explorer here. And I'm going to zoom in so you can see this. Um, if you've not used Storage Explorer or, or Azure even at all, you can go to azure.com. Uh, so far, every time I've gone to it, there's been some kind of free sign-up thing where, like for 30 days, you, you can use a bunch of stuff and either get charged zero for it or they give you what I call Azure bucks. I think the current, the, well, I say current, the last time I looked, it was like $200 that you could spend on stuff. And there's some of these services that are just free forever. So there's like 25, and they're constantly adding to that and changing the deal. But there's about 25 services that just don't cost you anything. One of the things I'll share with you is last year, the cost for storing my CSV file doubled, and it killed me. 
It went from a penny a month to two cents. Yeah, it's got awful expensive. But what it's doing is it's, it's, it's really, really cheap. When you start thinking about storage, especially in, um, in these days when you, I keep reading about these ransomware attacks and they just they, they kill me. And I was reading a story today, uh, Buck Woody, if you don't know who Buck Woody is, look him up and follow him on social media, or at least LinkedIn. Um, I, I love uh, Buck's posts on all social media. He's, he's hilarious, by the way. <clears throat> but he uh, talked about how they've got OneDrive now set up so that it can serve as a backup for ransomware. <clears throat> so will that, you know, get hacked? It, everything is susceptible to getting hacked at some time. But... The fact that they would come out and advertise that means they put some robust stuff around that. And I just, hey, I was reading some story about a, a bunch of small towns in Texas, you know, and you think about, you know, a small, they don't, they can't afford any of us <laughs> to come in and help them protect the database or, you know, do sysadmin work. So they're just in a world of hurt. Well, now they're moving all of their files out to things like OneDrive where they can recover them. They're automatically backed up and they can just say, no, and there was a really horrible stat in there. I want to say it was Baltimore has so far spent something like $18 million instead of the 70-some thousand they asked for. So not, a, uh, not an ad for doing that, but these are the, you know, the numbers count, okay? Numbers matter. So what I'm looking in here, this is the, um, the actual storage account. So in C-O-N-T for container, um, AW, there's the accuweather.csv file, and we can see looking at the timestamp, it was actually uploaded at 612. Um, that's the six o'clock data. If we were to open that file and scroll down to the bottom, we'd see a six o'clock entry in there. It's possible, but not likely, that we would see the 612 entry. Remember, it's, it's recording every 12 minutes. Um, but because that, that old e machine is so slow, I have to push this out to like 612 to get it to get the six o'clock data in there. If we look at, um, let's see, we've got Azure Portal open over here. If we were to look at andyweather.com, uh, we might be able to, to see it. That's a really, really slow website again, stressing over here. But um, while it's loading, this is, like I said, this is being refreshed every hour and it gets picked up. And then back over here, now there's Andy Weather, and it looks like, yes, it's uh, got a reading in from yesterday morning. Um, it was 75 in my office. I need a new air conditioner. And uh, outside, it was 80 degrees. So I've got an air conditioner that will do a great job in, like, a closet. I need one that will do my whole office. Um, to, if we go to, um, to, the, uh, to Azure, uh, this is portal.azure.com, and... Um, I'm a, um, I am a data platform MVP. Uh, I, was one, I was a SQL Server MVP from 2007 to 2012. On March 1st, I got data platform MVP, uh, which was very, very cool. A lot has changed in seven years. And one of the things that's changed is they, they, they did this in the past. They would give you like $100 or $150 a month. I think I get $150 a month. But you can apply for a program where you can get like 1000 a month. And it's like this big bucket of cumulative thousands of Azure bucks that you can use. And you need that. I mean, I can burn through 150 bucks in like 10 minutes if I assi assign one of these half a terabyte of RAM uh, machines with 64 cores. And um, then you have to start paying them, and that's no fun. So they, they were gracious enough to do that. So all cards on the table, I get to uh, play, and it doesn't cost me anything. So I've got my, uh, my awesome dashboard here, but you can create multiple dashboards. Again, Azure.com, sign up, and you can play too. Um, this A demo is a data factory, and I clicked that, and it took me over here to, uh, to the actual data factory. And when I start off, it takes you to this screen, and, and this screen is uh, kind of like the, uh, the overview. So I think that's what it's called. Yep, the overview. And there's a lot of options in here. Uh, create a pipeline or create one from a template. Copy data is kind of a, like a really quick start because this is what most people are using uh, data integration for, whether you're in the cloud or on-premises. Uh, configure an SSIS integration runtime. This is pretty cool, and they've done a lot of advancements on this, even in the past three, uh, well, I'd say, I was going to say three or four months, but really the past uh, couple months. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get there. This is maybe one of my favorite things to see, setting up a code repository. Um, 
I may have published the very first chapter on Team Foundation Services, and I did it in an SSIS book, like, I don't know, 14 years ago. Um, I, I'm big on life cycle management, and this is built on top of life cycle management. So I love that Microsoft's doing this in Azure. And they started this way back when they, uh, with uh, Azure Resource Management, ARM templates, um, and they have just continued it so that it, you can just check these in and then check them out. You can move around, Tom. Is that Azure DevOps or is that Team Foundation? You can do both. Okay. So when you go to DevOps, you can actually use uh, Azure's uh, Azure Git or you can use uh, TFS still in the cloud. But if you have an option, oh, now I say this, I haven't clicked that in a while. They, uh, back in a, a while ago, you had the option of that or GitHub, and, and you could do that. But it's, what, it, what I'm thrilled about is it's sitting here on the front page. So they want you to do source control. They want you to do lifecycle management. And just like security, it's not something you want to tack on at the end. You want to build it as a foundational piece, and they have. So kudos to them. This guy here in the video is this uh, Gaurav, Gaurav Malhotra. Gaurav, Gaurav is a smart guy. You see him there talking to Hansman in a couple of these videos, and he's talking about Git integration and, you know, uh, dependent pipelines and ADF. Smart guy. Um, so I would encourage you to watch those videos on this page, and there's more tutorials and stuff down here on the very, very front page. Once you get, after you've created a data factory, I'm not going to talk about how to provision a data factory here, but if you go to my blog, and this was on that slide, but let me uh, go to my blog so you can see it. My uh, CSS is messed up. It comes and goes. But um, you can type in, um, there's the search, uh, provision, and it should take you to a uh, list where the CSS is working of how to do things like provision uh, an Azure Data Factory. Um, there's, I promise you there's posts in here on that. And yeah, you can you can dig through you can dig through this. Is that me? Am I ringing? If that's that's my ringtone. If that's for me, I'm not here. Um, I'm kidding. I told her not to call while I was presenting. All right, um, that's enough of that. So now the next one is the design, and this is uh, author the author page. And you can see I've got a uh, you know quite a few pipelines in here. Uh, anybody do SSIS? I know some of you do. Right? Okay, everybody. You can think of this more as a control flow, a pipeline. Um, are there data flows in SSIS? Actually, there's, oh, sorry, in ADF, there's two now. One's in private preview still. It's called a wrangling data flow. You can think about a wrangling data flow as um, kind of like an explore and discover. It's kind of like the Power BI data flows. Power BI has data flow. Everything's got data flows now, right? But uh, it's more like that the wrangling data flows are. The one that's in, I want to say it's in public preview right now, is mapping data flows. And you can actually see those. And they're more like the data flows you're used to using inside of, uh, inside of SSIS. So I don't have any configured here. And you can see they are in preview. Um, I was, even before I was an MVP back in, um, back in March, I got, got a call from a guy who's now a friend at Microsoft, he's like, we want to see what an SSIS person does when we, they start playing in this new tech. Do you want to play? And I was like, yes. So I got to play with it about a year ago. Um, they're, they're cool. And they're constantly adding new stuff and new uh, stuff to it, um, new functionality. Cromer Big Data, I think, is the Twitter handle you want to follow. His name is Mark Cromer. Follow him. He's put a bunch of videos on LinkedIn. And if you follow his uh, video, you go out there to his LinkedIn channel. I don't know. He's got dozens of videos out there demoing that. Go watch those and learn more about that. Um, of course, that's like your control flow in SSIS is more of a pipeline. Data flows, of course, are like data flows. Data sets are kind of like your, they're analogous to like your, your source and destination adapters, kind of. It's not quite the same. Uh, down here beneath the uh, data sets, you've got connections, and you have uh, what they call uh, link services, and these are kind of like your um, connection managers. Again, it's, the analogy breaks down pretty quickly when you start poking around in here. At the very bottom, you've got triggers, and this is something you don't have in SSIS. Um, <clears throat> triggers are more like if you're using Windows Scheduler to, or another scheduling application, 
to call from the command line, start an SSIS package or SQL agent um, integration services job step type. That's that's what they're, but that's kind of neat, and they're constantly tinkering with these too. When they came out with um, ADF version two, and this is version two, they uh, didn't have some of the functionality that, that they now have, like that on blob created functionality I told you about. That didn't exist until about a year ago or so. <clears throat> um, so lots of uh, lots of cool stuff here. And what we're going to do is we're going to add a new pipeline, and I'm just going to click the plus here, and we're going to call this one. Um, Let's see. What is it? Is it triad or tripass or triangle? Tripass. Okay. We'll call this tripass um, loader, and I'll, I'll stick an aw in the middle there, so it's an Andy Weather loader. And this is just the name of the um, of the pipeline that we're creating here. The name of the the ADF pipeline. I can put a description in there if I want. Set concurrency stuff. And there's a bunch of stuff we're not going to cover that's on here. Um, we can do things like parameters. And variables, and these work similarly to parameters and variables in SSIS. Um, so, a bunch of stuff there. This is activities, and you can think of activities as being analogous to tasks in SSIS. Um, we're going to start with uh, under general. You see, there's a lot in here. For instance, that, there's one of my favorites: execute pipeline, execute SSIS package. So, you we'll look at this briefly in, in a little bit, but you can move your SSIS from on premises now into the cloud. So there's two options for that. One is you can put it in a catalog. If you've got a catalog configured on premises, you can then lift and shift into the cloud. And um, they realized um, when, they were, when they introduced that, uh, a, lot, a bunch of people kind of rushed them to start with, and then it fell off. And they started asking, you know, why aren't the rest of you doing this? And they found that more people were not using the catalog, even in 2019, than are. And I totally get that. Number of reasons why people would want to do that. So they turned around and made it so you can execute SSIS packages from the uh, the cloud file system, which is Azure Blob Storage. So we'll look at that when we get to the end here. But love those. Um, here's that stored procedure activity, and I can drag and drop this just like I can in SSIS. Pretty cool uh, web work here, and just like. Uh, just like in my other one I showed you on it. I'm going to name this in truncate instead of WAC. Um, and then for my SQL account, um, you know, I want, to, I want to link service. And I've got a list of them here that are already set up. But what I love about this, a couple of things. You hover over those little uh, black dots with an eye in the middle. There's always information here. And this changes uh, from time to time. So I check them every time. I'm going to build a new one right here. And I'm going to name this link service um, LS. Tripass, and I'm not going to use this is not an Azure SQL uh, warehouse. I'm going to be using Azure SQL DB, <clears throat> so I'll pick that. And it's asking me, you know, how do you want to set this up? This Azure Key Vault is really cool. So if you're going to do any kind of like enterprise um, Azure stuff, enterprise architecture based on Azure, you don't want to learn about Azure Key Vault because you can keep all your secrets in there. Microsoft manages them. You don't have to. Um, this is nice, though. I've got a couple of Azure subscriptions, so I've got the one for Enterprise Data and Analytics, and then I've got one that one that Microsoft gives me. That's that's that one. Uh, but I can I can just leave it set to select all, and I can pick my server. Now I'm in the A demo, so I'm going to pick SVA demo, and then for my database name, I've got one called DBA demo. I'm going to use um, SQL authentication, but you can pick. Uh, managed identity or service principles. Again, not going to dive into security here because we talk about it till midnight. Um, my username, uh, admin Andy, but note this little blurb right there, add dynamic content. So remember before we were looking at variables and parameters, I could have stored that in one of those. I could also store it in Key Vault and, and pull it in that way. My uh, super secret password, one, two, three, four, five, and then uh, any other connection properties. But what I can do right here is test that connection and make sure it's working like I want it to. And it's always good when it succeeds first, but you know, being a developer for so many years, I always get suspicious when anything works for me the first time. So I'm going to click Finish. And what it's going to do is it's hooking into that database. And again, what am I trying to do? What's the problem I'm trying to solve here? I'm trying to hook, this, uh, hook up this link service so I can get to a stored procedure. I'm, I'm configuring this truncate stored procedure activity. 
Now, when it did that just now, it refreshed this list. And there's one in there, it's in a staged schema, and it's called truncate WX reading, WX short for weather. But if it wasn't in there, I could click refresh, and really quickly it would populate this list. That's a stored proc I want. If there were parameters, there aren't. I could import them here. And we can actually test this. And I really like that we've got this functionality, but I want to show you before we test it, we've got this publish all button up here. And it's saying, hey, you've got something that's unpublished. If I go down my list of pipelines, there's my tri-pass uh, AW loader. Notice it's got an asterisk beside it. It's at the beginning instead of the end of the name, just like in SSIS when you've got something that's unsaved. This is unpublished, so it's kind of the cloud version of unsaved, okay? This is, again, this is inside the pipeline, which is basically like a control flow. Right. That's it. But what I can do is, just like in SSIS, I can click that debug button and the play button, and it'll actually flip me over to the output here, and you'll see that it's running and it's in progress. Now, this is done, all right? But if you look at this little iMessage here, it'll tell you, hey, I'm going to refresh every 20 seconds for the first five minutes, and after that, you can just click refresh if you want to. I did that to stall, hoping we'll get to around 20 seconds, and it'll show you that it lasted three seconds, but it's been done. Oh, only one second. And there it is. So it does, it does what it says. Um, and I, one of the questions that I get is uh, people who've been uh, played around with this in the past, maybe, and they've spent a couple of weeks working with it, and they'll say, you know, have you ever had this happen? You built it, it was working, everything was great. You ran it several times, you ran the next day, and then you came back to it a week later and it was broken. I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> that happens to me all the time. Now, why does that happen? I said, well, they're moving at about twice the speed of light out there in Shanghai. That's where the team is. And, you know, so sometimes they, they introduce breaking changes. Am I a fan of breaking changes? No. Do I write software for a living? Sometimes. Do I break, make breaking changes? Oh, yeah. I don't, all of my test cases aren't in existence, and sometimes that happens. I'm not trying to make excuses for them. I'm just telling you how it is. If you run into that and you think, oh, my gosh, I did something wrong, don't. Stop. It's not you. It's them. They didn't test your use case. So what do you do? Well, you, here's what I do. I go right over here to my, uh, my pipeline, and one of the options I have here is clone. And I clone that pipeline. And what does it give me? Well, it gives me another store procedure name, Truncade. There I am. Pipeline number two, big as life. I'm ready to go. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and close this one, and I'm going to discard the changes when I do. So it's only going to throw away pipeline two. Note my tri-pass AW loader is still here, still changes are there. Just be aware that this functionality exists. They didn't leave you in the cold. Um, they, they left the door open and you're chilly, but they didn't push you out into the cold yet. So just be aware that these things will happen and they're kind of normal. And, you know, this is, this is how software is developed. I, you know, I wish I could push the magic button and make it not this way, but this is, this is how I do it. <clears throat> so I feel pretty good when they're doing the same thing, right? It makes me feel smart when smart people are doing what I'm doing. All right, so that's a truncate one. There weren't any records in that table, so it, it didn't wipe out that much. The next piece I want to do is I want to do the copy data part. And I'm going to use, this is a very old, this is ADF uh, version 2 we're looking at right now. In version 1, they had uh, the copy data functionality. It's, it's never going anywhere. Um, if you want to add or take away uh, the equivalent of precedence constraints, right? I can delete that. And you're looking at that and going, Andy, hey, uh, you can't connect that to anything. Well, you're right. But see this right here? If I click that, I can add on success, on failure, on completion or on skipped. We're not going to talk about on skip, but it's nice that it's there. Um, on success, I want this to, uh, there, see that came back? I want this to go ahead and copy this data. Um, so also, in the activity, I can clone an activity. I can look at the code for an activity, or I can trash an activity. So let's look at the code. We've already seen kind of what clone looks like. This is JSON, or as my friend and brother Kevin Hazard says, hipster XML, um, and uh, you, can, you can modify this. You can actually type in this. You can do things like say, you know, the timeout's only six. Um, or, well, if you've got NumLock on, you can say the timeout. I said you could edit it. Am I lying? I think I am lying about that one. Cannot edit in a read-only. Okay, that changed on me uh, since the last time I tried that. Um, 
but you do have the oh and this is going to get in the way let me turn that off it thinks every time I make a change it's like hey you need to log in it's secure um, I don't know what you can edit now and what you can't there was a time when you could edit this code anybody work with ADF version 2 nobody okay well I was looking for some backup thanks Tom you're fired um, <laughs> The other one is, uh, all right, so I'm going to copy my, uh, my Andy weather data. And notice it's, it's uh, updating here. And I've got a lot more fields on here. So source, we kind of get, right? But what in the world is sync? Well, this is where it kind of helps to be an electronics engineer. That's not uncommon. We talk about sources and syncs in electronics. It's kind of like sources and destinations. So don't get wrapped around that axle. Um, again, I'm going to... I'm going to pick this source and I'm going to make a new one uh, here and this gets a little complicated. So the first thing it's going to ask me is um, I'm making a new data set. So it says what is your source? Well if you remember it's a CSV file sitting in blob storage. So I'm going to pick that and then down here at the bottom of my list I'll click continue and then it gives me uh, what's your format and uh, I'm going to do comma separated values CSV and I click continue and then it wants to know all sorts of information about it, what's this called. So I'm going to call this one CSV uh, TriPass. Oops, I've been doing that capitalization there. Which link service do I want to be? Um, well, I don't have one. I do know the first row is a header. I'm going to go and check that box. But in my link service, I'm going to make a brand new link service now. And this is going to be my blob storage. And again, I'm going to call it uh, BS for blob storage, try pass. Don't think I'm saying anything bad, I promise I'm not. And then it gives me um, the authentication method. How do I want to connect to this? By the way, it's connected by uh, via an integration runtime. The only one that's of the correct type for me to use to connect is this um, automatic one. It's called auto resolve integration runtime. So I'm just going to go with that one. But the fact that you have the option of making new runtimes is a difference in the architecture, right? Imagine if you uh, were coding in some environment and you could drop down and say, yeah, I want to make an SSIS package or I want to make uh, Apache Storm <laughs> or Spark. All of that's coming, by the way. Uh, I don't know if it's going to come inside of SSIS like that, but if you look at the bullets for um, SQL Server 2019, there's always like three marketing bullets. Number three is Spark. So if you don't know Spark, go learn some Spark. It's hard. It's not easy. But it's kind of like a uh, framework type engine. And they built this with the ability to add different types of integration runtime engines in here. We have, we have this one, which is the one that's, you can call it ADF native. I don't know a better term for it. We've got this one already. But we've got a version now called the uh, Azure SSIS integration runtime. And it actually has two flavors. One of them is you can connect to a catalog in the cloud. The other is you can run from blob storage. I keep mentioning that. But that's the, the only one that applies to what we're trying to build here is the auto resolve integration runtime. So i um, got a question from chat. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sure. Are you able to import Excel files? That's a good I haven't tried importing Excel files. I, I'm sure there's a way to do it. I don't know if there's a native way to do it. I, and I wasn't paying attention when I was walking through my um, my properties here, but it is not listed in here. But I can certainly, um, so you've got, you've got a couple of ways you can extend things like um, uh, Logic Apps is one and Azure Functions is another. And so you're kind of limited to your coding skills at that point. And I'll be honest, when um, these days when I'm interacting with Excel, uh, even in SSIS and I'm on premises, I'm not doing it with the connection managers that SSIS ship with. I'm doing it with script. I'm in C Sharp. And uh, that, that's how I do it. Um, and it's... The drivers, the Excel drivers still buggy. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not just that, but that's part of it. The other is the um, default tolerance, and I always end up hitting some bug. 
not a bug. I always end up hitting something that I don't understand why it's doing what it's doing. And I think there's like eight data types in Excel or something like that. You know, and it just, it, sorry, there's, there's a limited number of data types that the SSIS connection manager will expose from Excel. That's crazy talk. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Unrecognizable, yes, uh, objects, yes. Tom, did you have something too on that? Yeah, PowerShell to CSV, not a bad way to go there either. Um, I'm an old coder, so I, I, I keep falling back to code. That's kind of, it's go, go somewhere where you're comfortable and do it that way. The answer to the question is yes, but it's not straightforward. Um, I, what I'd like to see is on the screen I'm looking at right now is I'd like to see Excel in here, or I'd like to see a connector that, and it may be in here and I just don't, I just hadn't used it. Um, there may be, uh, you, you see, I don't see Excel, but there may be Microsoft Excel. Access, there's Access. That's close. Uh, there was the old jet driver. Remember the old jet driver? Yeah, that, I get a little headache right here. When I, never mind. <laughs> um, Office 365, that may be a way to do it. I've not done, uh, in, in, in some, I've not done what you're asking, but I, I know it's possible. Could be. Is it? You you mean it's not? There's no just click and go interface for Excel. I'm sorry. Did I say that out loud? All right. Um, so yeah, let me. Sorry. Go ahead. I wouldn't want to do that. I wouldn't want to write that if I. That's why I I just I've got a nice little cut and paste thing that um, that I use. So. Let's do ABS for Azure Blob Storage. That's no confusion because um, this is really cool stuff. When I get to the authentication method here, and by the way, did you see all that navigation back and forth? That's, that's kind of cool. That, they had nothing like this uh, until uh, relatively recently. Um, the SAS URI. So this is a shared access signature. Perhaps one of my favorite features uh, of this. We want to pop back over here to, uh, to Blob Storage. And, and, and kind of zoom in here for just a minute. Let's say me and Kevin Feasel, we're working together on a project, and Kevin says, you know what, Andy, I want to play around with your weather data there. And I can say, well, you know what, if there's only that one file in here, I can get a shared access signature. Now, I mentioned earlier that they've built lifecycle management into the foundation of this. They've also built security into it. And I can click this Get Shared Access Signature. This is the SAS. Um, I can have access policies. I can have start times and end times on it. I'm going to go ahead and make this one the 31st. And, um, you know, you can read and you can list. Those, those are the defaults. But you could also, maybe, Kev, maybe Kevin can write or create or add or delete. Um, and since it's the only file in there, maybe I want to give him access to the entire container. Right? When I click Create here, um, now I've got access set up for this, and I've got things like the, um, like the URL here, and one of the things I can do, I'm going to need to copy that. Um, if I go back over to ADF, it's asking me for the URL. Now, there's more in here than I need, so if I go back like to the beginning, and take out everything beyond this. This is the this is the access key here. And let's just do a delete on that real quick. Um, and you know people that are if you're thinking like you know you want to go in here and destroy this, that's fine. It'll be back in an hour. Um, knock yourself out. Um, and then the token, which is kind of the, this is the security piece right here. And if I've done this right, if I test the connection, it will succeed. So I have not done it right. You have a backslash after your CSV. That's what it is. Okay, thank you. Good, good pair programming there. That's why I picked my. Okay, there we go. So that's where that's working. And again, this SAS URL, I can make it good for a minute. <laughs> you know, you you got a minute, go, and you can come access this file, download it. Um, but after a minute, your access gets cut off. That's pretty cool. I, after I've created it, I'm not sure. 
There's probably a way to manage this from a portal, but again, part of the reasons why I wave off security is I'm not good at it. And part of the reason I'm not good at it is I'm friends with Brian Kelly. You know who Brian Kelly is? South Carolina writes all the articles. It's um, not all, a lot of articles at uh, SQL Server Central on security. Whenever I get a security thing, I call Brian. That's, it doesn't scale, but that's my solution. Call Brian Kelly. Hey, how do I do this? And he sends me a script and I do it. It's Brian's fault I never learned security. It's not true. I know enough about it to be dangerous, but I don't know. I don't know the answer. Of, you know, can you um, can you edit this after you do it? I've done and what I've recommended to everyone is don't uh, don't lose that. Right? Copy and paste it into a notepad or something because I don't know how to get back to it. There's probably a way. I just don't know what it is. Now here's my um, my file path. And remember, um, I didn't go into this a lot, but there's a container named C O N T A W container Andy Weather. There is no directory, but you can put directories in there. When you put a directory in a container, it's weird. Okay, it's not really like a directory or a folder in uh, Windows. It's more like it's part of the file name. So if you, some places where you go to access it, in fact, you access it by putting in the directory. And if you've got nested directories, you put them all in and then the file name. It's weird. Right, so it's not exactly, it looks a lot like what you see in your file system on premises, but it's not. So there is no directory here for this, and my file is named accuriteweather.csv, and the CSV is uh, all caps. And ask me how I know that counts. That's case sensitive. First row in the header, uh, file name does not support a wild card. I, didn't, I don't think I put a wild card in here. Let's double check. Did I put a space? No, there's no space. Okay, it's just fussing. Let's, uh, we can go next advanced or we can just click finish. I'm gonna click finish and see if it works. And how am I gonna know if this works? That's a good question. So one way to check this out is to pop over here into data sets now and look at the CSV tri pass. So if I open that up, I can see, yep, there's my, uh, so it's just, you know, a generic, um, gosh, I can't make that smaller. But just the generic, the name there, the connection. I can test the connection. All right, that was that worked. Um, I can preview the data. And look, there's data. So when I see this, I'm kind of happy. I, I know that you know I, I would rarely click the test connection button first. I just come over here and do this because if I can see this, the connection's working. Um, there's some schema stuff in here though, or as we say in Farmville, schema. And if we look at the schema, um, there's our you know, column name and our data type. CSV, everything's a string. And just, by the way, if you're loading data, it's a popular pattern to extract to a flat file, pick it up from a flat file and put it in something else. If you're doing it that way, or if your source data is a flat file, load it as a string, varchar and varchar, don't do that to yourself. Don't strong data type the date times or the numbers. Just look, you get it into this database first. Then you do what you want. Knock yourself out. Convert, coalesce, as you know, um, cast. Do what you want. Um, this one isn't saved yet, and I can't like right click and say just just deploy this part of it. And it gets it gets a little weird if I don't do this. So I'm going to try and publish it. It's going to fuss at me because I'm not finished configuring the copy data. Now, I did that on purpose. That was an error on purpose. I'll fess up if I don't, if I mess them up. So in here, I've got most of the source set up like I want to. I'm not going to configure anything else for now because I don't have time. Remember, the sync is like the destination. Well, I've already got the database or the, um, I've got a, do I have a data set? I don't. I've got a link service set up to my, to my uh, database because that's where my truncate is, remember? So I don't really have a data set yet, so I'm going to do new. And I'm going to go in here and do Azure SQL database and then continue. Up at the top, um, I'm going to call this um, Azure SQL table AST TriPass. And it's asking me for my link service. I'm going to be able to use LS TriPass. That's the one I created a minute ago. Notice it just loaded all my tables. Did you see it kind of change? And now it goes to none. So there's a table called Stage WX Reading. 
Um, I can import my schema from the connection store. And I'm going to go to Next Advanced. And that's going to take me over to the data set editor. Remember, we just opened this for the other one. Now we're, now we're bringing this in. And uh, again, I can preview this data. There's no data in there. But there's my column names. They're different from the uh, CSV files. Column names, but they're showing up. That's a good thing. Uh, when I go over to Schema, again, there they are. And that makes me happy to see them all there. Back to the TriPass loader and sync, I can load to a stored procedure. This is kind of neat, right? I've been doing SSIS for a long time. And people get surprised sometimes when I'll tell them that if I'm on the same server, same physical or virtual server, and I'm doing data integration, that it's often faster if you're just looking for raw speed, it's often faster to use stored procedures and let SQL OS do this. Not always, but often. There's a couple of caveats, like for everything. But people were like, ah. I remember I was in a speaker room at a SQL Saturday when I first said that. And they were like, what? You're an SSIS guy. You're supposed to be talking about SSIS all the time. And I'm like, no, I'm the solve the business problem guy. And sometimes SSIS is the right answer. Sometimes using no SQL OS is the right answer. Because it'll pick it up and put it down a lot faster sometimes than SSIS, especially on the same machine, because the very first thing a data flow has to do is pick it up and load it into RAM. And while the RAM is really fast, once it gets there, it's not so fast loading it into RAM. Everything has that problem. What's the bane of relational database engines running on premises or anywhere? What is it, Tom? What's the number one problem? What's slowing me down every single time? Yeah. I.O., yeah. I was going to say users. Well, <laughs> turn your mic off when you said people can hear you. <laughs> but, yeah, users can get in the way, too. But I.O., I.O. is the bottleneck. So you, we're working around I.O. all the time. That's exactly what an SSIS data flow does when it picks up 10,000 records or however many and brings it into RAM. It's I.O. When it writes it out of that data flow back into it, it's I.O. SQL OS can do that a lot faster, sometimes a whole lot faster. So same deal here. You can write this to a stored procedure in a database, and you can do your, you can practice a pattern, or really it's an architecture, called ELT as opposed to ETL. So ETL is extract, transform, and load. You pick it up, transform it, load it. Remember when I was talking about the data types earlier? Maybe it's written, as, it's a string that represents a date. You load that as a string. Then you go read that string, which is a date, and you transform it into a date time data type, and then you write it to a table that's expecting that data type. That's a transformation. But if you do ELT, you pick it up, you put it down, and then you run a stored proc or something else against it that changes that string date into a date time date. Do the same thing here. You can do a lot of ELT with what we've got right here by loading it and having the stored procedure do the transformation. And you can also do ETL this way too by loading it in. It depends on what's in the stored proc. Um, very handy to have this. In addition to that, a pre-copy script. You can do data manipulation prior to picking it up. Yes, sir. Sorry, I want to know more about the stored procedure thing. So, I mean, is that the row by row processing from the source? Um, the st so the question is, does the stored procedure pick it up row by row? It, um, so, I don't, it, I think the answer is it depends. And I want to say I don't know, but I do because, I, but I've not seen it yet. I've not loaded enough data yet to tell, to give you the answer for that. Um, and I, I imagine it's going to depend on the source, the link service in this case, and the data set that we're picking up. I, I mean, I, I assume there's some way to map parameters to um, There is. There is a way to do it. So whenever you bring in a, a stored proc, and then you can, um, of course, you can edit. You can either, map, according, according to this little I dot, it's saying you can uh, enter the, the uh, store procedure manually, or you can get a drop down. There, again, there's only this one truncate uh, in here for now. And, you know, I, I haven't tried it. I, I haven't tried this yet. I've been using the, um, the copy data just to do the copy. And I need to, though, because that's a really good question. Uh, of course, you can, again, a lot of stuff here that you can set. And if I go to mapping here, 
Uh, this is one of the things I wanted to share with you about this. Back in the day, like a year ago, I don't even think it had been released yet. This would auto map. You click on this tab, and it would just, and it would get it right. It would guess and get it right. When I click import schemas, um, I'll get half of it. So I'll get the destination pieces. I don't know why. I don't get the rest of this, but this has changed. So three months ago, when I would do what I'm about to do, I'd have to do each each and every one of them. But when I did this three days ago, and maybe it's broken again. I don't know, or it may be acting differently. I would pick the first one. This is a wind direction. So when I drop my column down here and I look for wind direction, it was mapping more than one as I as I did this. So if I go down to this one, this is reading indoor humidity. And there's indoor humidity. And like I said, three days ago, this was, I did uh, a couple of them, and it started mapping the rest of them. I don't know why it's not doing that now. This is the wind direction. So maybe I'll have to map them all. Uh, maybe I did something different three days ago. Does it do wind direction twice? It does. That's peak wind. I mapped that one wrong. That never happens in real life. Uh, yeah, it does all the time. There, did you see that? It just, so it auto mapped most of the rest of them. And, and it did a fair job. This is what it did like three days ago. And I was like, that was new. Yeah, it could be. It's weird though. Like I said before, it would, you pop on this and this would all be done. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Oh, thank you. Date, time, timestamp. I saw something a while ago on a previous screen uh -huh. that on batch size of processing, do you have a recommended size that you've no. seen or whatever? I can, that's a great question. So the question for those who didn't hear was about regarding to batch size on one of the previous screens. Here's what I can guarantee you about that. It's going to change. It's always going to change. And it, you may set it and tune it. Uh, today, if you don't look at it in six months, come back and rerun your tests for tuning it, it's going to be different. Because they are change, constantly changing the everything. They're changing everything on these. I read an article not long ago, a couple of days ago, I think. It may have even been this morning that uh, was talking about the new AMD processors that they're starting to put in for high-performance computing. Things like that are going to change the the performance characteristic of the um, of the, the copy data, the batch size, the mapping data flows performance. It's it's that way in SSIS today. You change the hardware underneath it, it changes all of the performance characteristics of it. So. Um, Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, so when you provision ADF, you get to pick the, um, the, the size and the number of nodes that you're going to use. So it's usually a cluster that you're configuring. The default, I think, is a D3. I want to say it has two 8-core machines with 16 or 32 gigs. And it's not, not trivial. You can pick a pretty beefy one. And, about a year ago, they went from having six choices to 18 or so. And one of the ones they added was like an enterprise class that has, I think it's either 64 or 128 processors. I want to say it's 64 cores. And it's knocking on the door of half a terabyte. It's like 442 gigs of RAM. So you can get a big old box running these. And it, it reminds me, I don't know if uh, I answered your question, Tom. Let me know first. I want to say something else about that. Go ahead. And the other question is, if you're going to be writing SSIS because your main, all your machines are on-prem, right? would you start switching, even if the boxes are still on-prem, to writing everything in ADF? So the question is, if, and you know, it's 2019, we've got ADF version 2, would I switch from writing SSIS packages on-premises to uh, building SSIS or ADF pipelines? And so the answer is, <laughs> it depends, right. But what does it depend on? And let me describe this architecture, and don't let me forget the point that I want to make, and it kind of 
that's good to do this one first and then make the other point. The other point is about a new axis we can pivot on. So thing number one is now we have a life cycle, especially now that we've got the Azure SSIS integration runtime that'll execute DTSX files uh, individually uh, without needing to put them in a catalog in the cloud, right? So we can now stick them in blob storage and run them there. Uh, we can also put an ISPAC file up there and pick the package out of the ISPAC file. And we have a totally different thing that I don't have time to talk about at all, but if you go to my blog, write this down, Azure Enabled. If you remember that term, if you go to Azure-Enabled, in 2019, in the preview version, it's still in preview and there are bugs, of the uh, SSIS integration runtime, sorry, the uh, integration services extension. By the way, SSDT standalone installer, that's gone in 2019. The first time you hit that, you're going to look at it and go, what do I do? Go to Andy's blog and type in uh, Azure, I'm uh, sorry, SSIS VS 2019. I'll, I'll walk you right through it, installing it. It installs just like any other extension now. Um, so be aware of that. One of the options in the latest version of the preview um, it actually came out in 3.1, and I don't know if 3.1 is the latest or not anymore. But you've got another option when you create an SSIS project called Azure Enabled. And what you can do with that is you can, in, you can build your package, and then you can configure your connection to an Azure SSIS file share-based integration runtime. So you set all that up. And then when it's time to debug it, you can run it locally, just like you always do, right? Press F5, hit the green VCR control. Who knows what a VCR is? Tom, you do. <laughs> the rest of you, it's okay. Back before iPods and digital, what do they call those things? Uh, digital video recorders, DVRs. Back before all of that, we used to have put things on tape. Anyway, uh, and they, they, that's where the controls came from. The... Um, it, you, you got another option. You've got a little drop down in the play button. And if you hit that drop down, you'll see execute in Azure. And if you click that button, it deploys the ISPAC file out to where you configured your blob storage to point to. It picks the package. It runs it inside of the Azure uh, SSIS integration runtime you configured. And then it brings all of the information back inside of the progress or execution results, just like you ran it locally. It takes a few more seconds because it's doing more, but you've got a lot more interaction now between on-premises and cloud than you used to. Um, the, um, the, the, the point that I wanted to get to about the other piece of this, and I don't know if I finished my other point or not, that's getting old sucks, but the, op, you know, the, um, the alternative is not so good. Depends. Um, but uh, the other part of this is now we have an access that we can spin on that we didn't have before. Oh, wait, let me finish the first point. You've got a new life cycle. So what you can do, Tom, is you can take all of your Azure, sorry, all of your SSIS on premises, and you can move it to Azure if that makes sense. And there's actually some hybrid things you can do there, right? You can deploy um, uh, an Azure uh, SSIS Sorry, that's not right. You can deploy ADF sitting on, on premises, pieces of it sitting on premises, and you can execute pieces of it there. There's a bunch of things you can do with these integration runtimes. But one of the things that you can do, you've got this life cycle where you can, say, pick up your packages and put them in Azure just like they are. You can begin like that. Move, let's say you move all your source data to Azure and you move all of your destination because you want to play with the new shiny Power BI streaming, whatever, that's only available in Azure. And so you do all of that, and you move your SSIS up there as well. Then over time, you can play with this, right? You can test it and see what's going to perform better where. And this is another one of those things that's going to change. It, it'll be different today than it'll be in 20, August of 2020. But just be aware, keep your tests and run them, you know, every quarter or something. But you can find that, you know what, doing it this way in SSIS does okay. Maybe it runs in an hour. But if I rebuilt this process in ADF, I can get it to run in 10 minutes. That, that may happen. And now that you've got the ability to run in a catalog in the cloud, SSIS packages in the catalog, SSIS packages in blob storage like a file system, um, and ADF, now you can mix and match, 
right? So you can slowly convert your SSIS packages, the ones that make sense. You can convert those to ADF pipelines. And you can do it at your leisure, right? Just whenever you have time to do it. Well, a lot of people are never have, have never used the catalog. So the question was, do I find people are not, you know, just running SSIS from the file system? Yeah. According to um, the person I talked to at Microsoft who's in a position to know, he says that the numbers are 70-30. That about 30% of people are using catalogs and about 70% are running from the file system. Now, my experience informs me that that's probably low that the number is probably lower than 30% of people that are using the catalog on premises. But with this caveat, if you were to look at the market cap, so I was talking to a large government agency a couple of weeks ago, and they're running 800 SSIS packages a day, right? They're not like uh, the same, they're not in the same ballpark as people who are running 20 a day. So if you're running 20 a day, who cares, <laughs> right? It's only when you get to what I call enterprise scale that this question even becomes a question. And that only happens when the companies are larger, for the most part. So if you look at market cap, it's probably closer to the Pareto principle, 80-20. 80% of the money is running something in some kind of framework, be it the catalog or some custom framework they built to run it in the file system or some combination of the two. But if you're not there, you don't need it, and it doesn't matter. Don't waste your time, right, if you're there. The other piece of this is um, this mapping data flows is a game changer. So uh, not long ago, past few weeks, they introduced the ability to manage drifting schemas. So if somebody changes an NVAR char 60 to an NVAR char 61, that breaks an SSIS data flow. It does not break a mapping data flow. Okay? It picks it up and goes with it. And It's magic, yeah. <laughs> There's, uh, I'm not exactly sure how they're doing it, but I will. I do know that. Um, uh, remember, I mentioned earlier um, Spark, Learn Spark. That's what that's what those data flows are running on. So they are not anything like SSIS data flows. It's an entirely different animal. And what they'll do is, if it needs a hundred spots to run, it'll spin up a hundred, and then run it and then spin them back down. Spark is um, it's pretty cool. It, it really is. And if you get a chance, if you have some time, then learn about it. And if you don't have some time, learn about it. You'll just push the Trust Andy button and let's move forward. Um, do spend some time learning it. Get that Azure Data Engineer thing, certification, two tests, 200, I think it's 200 and 201. Do those, DP 200, 201. Trust me, do that now. Um, the Microsoft Professional Program for Data Science and AI and Big Data, that died last Friday late in the afternoon. Crazy the way this happens. The email went out into the ether. It's over. You got to the end of the year to finish what you're working on if you signed up for any of those with edX. Um, so just be aware things are changing everywhere. <laughs> do, the, uh, do the DP test 200 201 get the data engineer cert if you're doing ssis today and learn that stuff the one the other thing that i want to share with you is that we've got this new access to pivot on and it kind of all plays into if you kind of add everything up that i've been saying the points i've been saying it gets you to here we're now living in an age where we can do things we never could do before or we could but they took an exorbitant amount of time compared to what they take now like who remembers when you were going to add a node to your network, maybe a, um, maybe you're going to add a new cluster node, right? So I was back in the day. That meant I left work at noon, took a long lunch, went to the computer store, used the company credit card to buy a box of parts, brought them back, worked Saturday and Sunday putting the parts together, loading the OS, loading the server software, testing everything, getting it all good, and then. If everything went well, Lord willing, Monday morning it came on and there was another node sitting on the network. Now you go to the slider and a, or a spinner button and you click and wait till the spinner runs for one to three minutes and it's over. That's one thing. The other thing is um, 
let's say it takes 24 hours to load my data warehouse and it costs me $100 in Azure bucks to do that. Well, I can move some things around and add some nodes and add some RAM and, and maybe add CPUs if I need to to the nodes. And I can spend $100 to load my data warehouse, same load, in three minutes. So while the math doesn't quite work out on the numbers, it isn't exactly $100 both times. But what can your business do with an extra 23 hours and 57 minutes of having that data? That's an axis we can pivot on that we couldn't before. And now we can when it comes to data integration. And I have done consulting work for companies where their existence is based on them winning the race. That, that happens. There are companies out there where if you win, you get paid, and if you don't win, you don't get paid. They're out there. There are markets like that. It's not just the income tax example. We've all heard so often that we just are sick of hearing it, but that's a valid example, and it's not the only business model that's subjected to time where time counts or seasons count. The cloud is, is not, there's, on-premises data is not going to ever go away. In 100 years, somebody's going to have whatever replaced servers then and it's sitting somewhere on their, you know, under their desk or in the basement, and it's going to be doing its thing. But there's only going to be like 12 of them, okay? And from here to there, it, that number's just going to continue to go from whatever it is now, billions, millions down to 12. And I'm making these numbers up, but you get my point, I hope. Will there be jobs uh, still in, in, those, in 100 years? Yeah. There'll be one or two. <laughs> That's jobs, right? Or job. But this isn't going back into the bottle. It won't fit. The bottle it came out of, it wouldn't go back into at this point. Learn this stuff. You don't, I'm not asking you to like it. I promise, I don't like some of it. But I'm asking you to learn it. Do that. You need to do that. And if I'm scaring you, well, good. I want to scare you. This is scary. Learn this stuff. Get good at this. All right. Now, back to the fun spot. But fun stuff. Now that I've said that, yeah, it's a happy presentation, most of, mostly. Um, so now we're ready and we can run. Again, we can do the debug thing. And now we've got two of these uh, dudes running. So when we get out here and refresh, of course, the first one will run in a second. We see that. And the second one is still showing in progress. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's going to take about um, 90 seconds or so for this to run and load. And it, it's weird the way that it loads. And I can't see under the hood to see exactly how it's loading. I just know that it is. Oh, okay, good. Can you see, everybody? Can you see? Were you all going to sleep? I was trying to scare you awake. I don't understand. Okay. Um, but this is doing its thing, and I love this, this, these little, this details thing. It's a little dashboard here that's showing me, um, you know, what's happening here. And I can learn more about the copy performance details here. I mean, there it finished. It loaded 56,730 rows in 43 seconds. I love metadata. I do. I'm, a, I'm an engineer, I warned you. Um, I love instrumentation. And I love being able to figure out the throughput. Look, I don't have to calculate the throughput. The average throughput was 116.493K per second. And there it's actually still filling in some of the blanks. So peak connections were two. There's only two, um, in, uh, two nodes in here, so it could only make two, two connections. But lots and lots of good stuff here. Finally, finally I can go up here to publish all and I can... Click that button, it'll show me over here it's publishing. And when it gets finished, it'll say it succeeded. And once it's succeeded, my publish all button will go away and I can add a trigger or I can trigger it now. If I click trigger now, it says, do you want to use the last published configuration? This is why I published it first. Yep, I just tested it. And I can go over to the monitor and we'll see the pipeline running. So there it is in progress, triggered by a manual trigger. I can zoom in, uh, view the activity runs, and now we're looking at something that looks remarkably similar to what we saw in debug just a minute ago, except it's actually published, deployed, if you will, and it's running now. 
The integration with Git changes those menus at the top a little bit or with, um, with Azure DevOps and it puts steps in the middle so you can work off of a branch. You're always working off of a branch and then you can, um, I think it's merge uh, and Git and I forget what it is in TFS, but you basically, you, you have to take it through that cycle. It's a couple of extra steps and then it gets published out there. Um, built right in. Um, don't raise your hands if you're not using source control, but do listen to me. There's two types of developers. And data integration, be it SSIS, ADF, Informatica, data stage, this is software development. There's two types of developers. Those who use source control and those who will. You will lose code. It'll break your heart. And you can set up Azure DevOps. I think it's the same deal that you had to the um, the Visual Studio versions before. Um, I think it's it's free up to five people on a team. So yeah, and it, that's awesome. It's free, free, free. Set up a free account. Start saving your code. If you speak, oh. you should start saving all of your code up there because mm -hmm. I can redo my presentation in three or four minutes. There's a there's a bunch of really neat stuff out there. Listen, if you haven't played with any of the new stuff in the past few years, don't beat yourself up. Go learn it. Um, learn the uh, learn Git, learn um, Azure DevOps, um, just how to use the site, if nothing else. And it's dev.azure.com. That's a DevOps site. And um, you know, and and look at things like Azure Data Studio, and this idea of notebooks. And you you know, Azure. This is my opinion about where Azure's going, but I've been saying this for a couple of years and I haven't stopped saying it because it looks like it just keeps going and going and going. <clears throat> Azure is not uh, trying to be the rope you in to a Microsoft thing. Oracle's doing that and some of the other clouds are doing that, but Azure's not. Azure's goal is to be the all of the above cloud. They're making deals with Snowflake and Storm and Spark and Databricks and all of these engines that can be used for data integration, they've got it all. And so go learn as much of that as you can because the more you learn about the different integration engines, the more better prepared you are to do things like say, you know what, we should use Snowflake for this or we should use, you know, Pig and Hive or, or what have you, or this should be pure Spark in Databricks. Um, the more tools you put in your toolbox, the more valuable you are. And, and Azure has got that seems to be their mentality. I wrote a blog post. I don't know. I, I actually I worked on it for about three a month, three four months. But it's called SSIS is not dead or dying. There was a comment made in a presentation that sounded like that was what was happening. And I actually met not far from here. In fact, I had dinner with Sandy Winarco, the program uh, manager at Microsoft. He lives in Shanghai. He flew over here because North Carolinas eat up with companies that do third-party SSIS controls, right? He came over here to share with them, not happening. And he's two hours from my house in Farmville. I was like, we should have dinner. <laughs> so we did. And I did an interview with him and I published it. They're, they just not long ago made it so you can use an integration runtime from the SSIS catalog. So here's one right here. And this is my favorite thing. I don't have too much time to go through this. I just want to show you this. Here's, oh, that's the catalog one. Let me go back. Um, this is the files one. So both of them actually have this. If you click on the, the status here, you get this execute SSIS package thing. It was actually back in the other one. You just couldn't see it. It was a teeny little icon, this guy. But if you click this, it builds a pipeline, pipeline two. It puts an execute SSIS package activity in it and it's pre-configured some of it. It knows you're using Azure SSIS files. If I'd have done the same thing at catalog, it would have put catalog in there. And it'll, it'll do this for you. This just, the Azure SSIS file based, file share based integration runtime came out at the end of June, it's like June 30th. This came out about a week later. SSIS is not dead or dying. They're still doing things and in Shanghai to add to this. Will there come a time when they stop investing in innovation in SSIS? Yep. 
Will there come a time when they stop investing in C-sharp and VB? Yeah. They've already said it's going to happen to VB earlier. But just like the thing, the announcement they made a couple, three years ago about we're going to make, we're going to innovate in C-sharp, and if it makes sense, we'll port it to Visual Basic. You're going to see the same sort of thing happening here, in my opinion. This is my opinion, that they're going to continue to innovate in, uh, in SSIS, and where it makes sense, or sorry, in ADF, they'll continue to innovate there. They'll continue to innovate in SSIS for as long as it makes sense. I think that is years from now. I'm 56 years old. I want to work till I'm 70, Lord willing. I think I'm good. I can stay in SSIS for 14 years. That's my opinion. Are they, um, are they continuing to innovate in it today? They are. And when you combine that with my other opinion, which is they want to be the all of the above, there is literally millions, maybe billions of SSIS packages on the planet right now. Do they want to throw all of that away? I don't think so. What about DTS? <laughs> what, what is DTS, Tom? Somebody actually called me in the last year, and they were doing DTS, and it was heartbreaking to have that conversation. It just was. I was like, oh, God, I, don't, I can't help you. And they were asking for some help, and I was like, I, I would I wouldn't either. I know for I mean I've occasionally run up on instances of SQL Server that do not have a year after it. That's pre two thousand, folks. It's out there, and some of it's for I won't say good reasons, but they have reasons and they make sense to the people that have them. And some of it I get, and some of it I don't. But it's like not unsupported applications, you know. And a company's long gone out of business that built that database, marketed that product. Um, it's tragic. Um, th again, the, the point that I want to make is this is the beginning of some automation here. This is like version 0.1. We're going to look back on this in four or five years ago. Pfft, we thought that was ADF automation, right? Maybe two or three years. But this is what they're starting to do. You click the button, and it builds you a pipeline, and it puts an activity in it, and it configures it, partially configures it. This is where we are in August of 2019. SSIS isn't going anywhere, in my humble opinion. Um, it does some things very, very well. It does, it does some really neat things really, really well. Spark and the mapping data flows does some things really, really well. I mean, Spark is built to scale. And Databricks is Spark on steroids. Okay, it's a Spark framework, <laughs> if you will. Um, the people that wrote Spark went and formed Databricks. And, you know, it's, it, it just, you don't have to check the scale box, okay? It scales. It says, oh, we need more resources, let's go. So it'll do it. Um, and those mapping data flows are built right on top of that engine. And it's right here inside of, of that. So what Tom asked earlier, would you ditch writing stuff in SSIS and start writing in ADF? Um, it, the answer really is it depends. If I know the workload is going to perform a thousand times better and cheaper in, um, in mapping data flows, absolutely, I'm going to build that in mapping data flows. It's my $100 example, right? If, if I'm in a race and I need it in a minute, not in a week, and I know those data flows will scale out to a thousand, it's going to cost me a hundred bucks, but you know what? It's only going to run for 10 seconds and it's going to scale right back down. This is not you moving the slider. This is it moving the slider for you, up and then down. Yes. It's magic. It's magic. And this is this is more coming. These, this is the new normal. And what they're going to do is automate on top of that. And they just keep doing that. Watch Mark Karma's videos on this. Watch them manage things like schema drift, stuff like that. It's... Stuff that it, it's a hard problem to solve if you've got a volatile source or no control over the source. The government is sending you the source. That's my favorite. Um, my, uh, the scariest thing I've heard in data integration is I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> yeah. Uh, be, be aware. And I don't care who is president, okay? I'm just saying. <laughs> so anyway, um, just a couple of uh, other things. We'll pop through some slides here at the end. Um, be happy to take any more questions as we go along. Um, I get paid to teach classes and consult, and I'm happy to help you. We're up to 
it keeps changing. I think we're at nine now. We had, I think we dropped off when we had 10 people there for a while. Uh, one found, I'm a consultant, I don't consider that a real job. So somebody went and got a real job. But I, I teach classes on like this. I do a day on fundamentals of Azure Data Factory. Um, if, you're, if you want to learn SSIS from zero to SSIS, and then I'm doing a, um, an expert SSIS course where we kind of, this will get you started and this will take you to, uh, to the next level. If you use this coupon code at a webinar, you can save 40% right off the top. These aren't cheap. You can find cheaper. That's by design. I don't ever want to win the race to the bottom. Uh, if you want this, I'll send it to you, man. You just drop me an email. Yeah, I'll send you the whole deck. And that way you can have this and the, the URLs and everything. Um, you want to learn more about me, andylender.blog slash learn dash more. And this is my email address I was talking about. I've got cards if you want a card. And then you can email me. I'll send you the slide deck. You can click the links or places that aren't links. You can highlight, copy, paste, and that'll work. I, um, I want to thank Kevin and Tracy. Um, I think Tracy's the one who talked to me at a SQL Saturday a few months ago about coming here and, and doing this. Um, it's always an honor to present, as I mentioned at the beginning. Nobody walked out. Nobody threw anything heavy and blunt. It's steamy in here. Thank you. Nobody fell asleep. Wow. But thank you all. <laughs> Any questions anybody has about anything? It doesn't have to be about the topic. I'll, I'll tell you I don't know if I don't know. Why is your website so slow? Why is my, because. <laughs> oh, the Andy, it's running on something called Plex. And um, that's got to be coming up on either renewing or dying. GoDaddy called me like 10 years ago and they said if you pay us a grand you can make as many websites as you want hosting sites as you want to and they they're right i can <laughs> but they don't run very so i've got managed wordpress uh, i do i use godaddy i've got managed wordpress on the blog and entdna and dilm suite and um Bemble Academy and SSIS Academy. Those run faster, but not really. The SSIS Academy one has been crawling the last month. And if I'm bored, which I don't ever get bored, I'll call them and say, hey, the sites are running really, or they're really, really sucking. I did that a couple of months ago, and they, there's nothing wrong on our end, and then they started running faster. <laughs> like, okay, so I'm cool as long as it works. No, it is. It's, it is slow. It's like 15, 20 seconds to load any weather. It's an experiment. That's it, yeah. And after, go ahead, Mark. Which, not the website, but it would it, it would probably run faster on the e machine than it does on the. What you got, Mark? Well, at 18, they fixed that. Oh, okay. So 18.2 is where you want to go. 18.1 had some quirks. But the, I think the current is 18.2. That can do 16, 17. I, I have, so far, the ones I've used it on, I've been able to open. Good. I think the bottom I've tried is 14. I don't think, that's, I don't, I'm not sure if it'll do 12. And I've, I could build one and test it. I need to. But it's, um. but yeah, there were some, SSMS had some challenges for a while, but they've, they've slowly worked it out. One of the things they did with 18.0 or 18.1, I think it was zero, they took away debug, so you can't debug stored procs, and that's still gone as far as I know, and they took away database diagrams. And I actually got into a little bit of a contest with Brent Ozar is a friend. I love Brent. I've known him for years, and um, he was talking about you know, if you ever read Brent on Twitter, he's always knocking people around. He doesn't mean anything by it usually. But um, he said something about that. Like, yeah, well, the 12 people who use that. And I'm like, well, I'm one of those. I mean, and they were like, well, why do you know? And then he got serious. He said, well, why, do you, why did you use that? And I said, well, I use debug to learn how the SSIS catalog works. Because you can debug store procedures. You can script the execution of a package in the catalog. And I said, not all of that was documented, and, and it's still not. But if you follow it through the two dozen stored proxy calls and watch how it works, you can learn a tremendous amount about it if you're bored, and I was. So 
um, database diagram. I, don't th I still think debug's gone, although I see comments about it pretty regular. People are saying uh, they brought it back. They brought diagrams back in 18, it's at least in 18.2. And I don't know. I think they thought, for both of them, I think they thought people just weren't using it. And, you know, I can, you know, um, my co-host on Data Driven, Frank, I shouldn't have said that. I'll change that subject. This is completely unrelated to Frank. But uh, marijuana is legal in Washington. I'm just saying. <laughs> So I don't know why they make some of the decisions they make, um, but it's uh, some of it. I, you know, sometimes I look at it and go, "Gosh!" I, and I I put something out a couple of days ago about the you know killing the Microsoft Professional Program, which started out as Microsoft Professional Degree. I don't know if you remember that or not. So to get some of these certifications, you have to take nine or ten classes and then complete a capstone project. Um, that's different than showing up and taking a, an exam. All the certification exams aren't easy, but it kind of reminded me of, it wasn't as, as intense as the old Microsoft Certified Master MCM stuff, but it was more that way than, you know, doing a proctored exam. So I'm disappointed. I shared that privately and with everybody who's watching or, you know, and you. Hey, the entire internet knows now. That's it. Um, I've been fired before. If I get fired again, it'll be all right. Um, but yeah, there's, I, I want, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see us focus more on more intense certification. And I want our field to be more of a craft and less of a paper cert, you know, library. Um, and I want more, I wish they'd bring the MCM back for SQL Server and data especially. And I was reading one of the blurbs that they had in the article where they said, um, like, if you're doing the, the Microsoft professional program for big data was misnamed. It was actually data engineering, which is what we do with SSIS and ADF. And they said, well, go get the, you know, take the two exams and get the uh, data engineer associate or whatever it is, which isn't. It isn't nothing. It, you got to learn a bunch of stuff to do that. And it, those are pretty intense exams. I'm not taking anything away from them. But it's also not the months it took to get the big data <laughs> certification. And it is not the capstone that you had to do to do that. I got that one. And, you know, they're telling me, print your certificates. It's okay. And it's like, really? I paid 100 bucks for each one of those. <laughs> there were 10 of them. You know, 150 for some. Print it. Scan it, stick it on LinkedIn. I think that's a mistake. So, not happy. But it's their certificate. Um, one of the things I learned when I was an MVP the first time, it's their program, it's their award. I actually volunteered to step away from it in 2012. I had some competing priorities. And I was very honored to be an MVP, and I'm very honored to be one again. It's rare you get to be one again. So... Uh, maybe that's maybe that's a better example of uh, marijuana being legal in Washington. I don't know. <laughs> they made me an MVP again. That's probably a better example. But um, yeah, they're they're making changes. They've got you know there are reasons internally. I'm sure why they're not going to share all of those with some redneck from Farmville. But um, be aware, keep up, uh, go get that cert. I'm I'm working on the cert, the Azure. Um, data engineer, associate, or whatever it's called. I'm working on that, those two exams. Um, I'm not telling you to do something I'm not doing myself. And it's good information. I've learned stuff just studying the little bit that I've studied so far. Learned the new stuff. So, all right, I'm going to start tearing down because it's after 8, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. If you have questions, I'll be here packing up, and I'll walk outside when they run us out of the building, and we can talk in the parking lot until I turn into a pumpkin. So, so for everybody on stream, thank you very much for hanging in there. Have a great evening.